Okay, welcome to our first lecture on recursion. We're going to be talking about this technique for the next few minutes. So what is recursion? Well, recursion is a problem-solving strategy. It's very powerful. Uh, it's one that we're going to use a lot in computer science. And uh, it's also one you're going to see a lot in some of your other classes coming up later, like algorithms and things, because there are a lot of kinds of problems that we can approach using recursion, which I know that doesn't tell you a whole lot yet, yet but um, let's try and define it a little bit more simply as it's a process um, that a procedure would go through, a procedure we would use, uh, when one of the steps in the procedure is for uh, rerunning the entire procedure, or basically calling itself. And you see kinds of uh, sets of steps of instructions that do this kind of thing all the time, where you're asked to repeat the entire thing. It says, go back to the top and do it again, so to speak. So, for example, if you had a procedure that had about four steps, the third step might say, run the entire process or procedure again and start over. And this goes on potentially infinitely, so we need to be sure that at some point we have uh, some way of stopping. Let's think of, look at a simple example, um, not necessarily in the realm of computer science to start with, and that is the, the example of the Russian nesting dolls that a lot of people bring back as souvenirs from trips to Eastern Europe. So um, the strategy is, is fairly simple. We want to open all the dolls, so that's the function that we're going to do. If we open the first doll and there's nothing inside, we're done. We can play with it, put it back together, set it on the shelf, whatever it is we want to do with it. Uh, admire it as our souvenir from our trip. Um, so we don't have to do a whole lot. If there's more than one, then we have to open the first one, and then we find another one inside, and we don't know what's inside that, so we open that one. And we keep doing this until we finally reach uh, the, the innermost, smallest doll. And uh, um, perhaps inside there we might find a piece of candy, at least the first time we do this. After that we may have eaten the candy, or some other prize in there. Um, or something like that. Maybe your uh, parents bought one of these when they were on a trip and hid another souvenir inside there. Maybe a piece of jewelry or something. So, um, But this is part of the process. So this iterative part of continuing to process this, the inner, inner doll over and over until we reach the innermost one, which would then be our base case, is an example of how recursion works. Okay. So from a programming perspective, it's a function that calls itself rather than calling it another function, which is what we're used to doing with functions in C and C++ and other programming languages. Um, so we know we can call function B from within function A, but now we are going to find out that we can call function A from within function A. We just have to have a way to make sure that, that this terminates eventually, otherwise we potentially overrun the stack so that it won't won't actually happen in infinitely because we'll have computing resources that are constraining how many times it can occur. Okay, So this looks at an example of a function that, that recurses without terminating, realizing, of course, that it really will terminate because of the stack. But, but in principle, at least if we had unlimited resources on our computer, it wouldn't terminate. <clears throat> we start out with a print function that's going to print some stuff. Notice this is just a declaration of the function. We'll see the body of it in a minute. And then main calls that print function, and then when the print function finally returns, um, it does a system pause, which is that thing that just pops up on at least on a Windows machine and says, hit any key to continue, and when you do that, then the program terminates. And then let's look at the print function, which uses the library function printf, and prints a, a message, and then calls itself. Now this one technically, again, assuming unlimited resources, uh, would never exit. In other words, it would just keep printing that message over and over and over, and so we'd never even execute the system pause because uh, it would never exit. Uh, so the only way we'd be able to exit this is by doing like a control C or some kind of a kill from the keyboard or or some some other uh, system function. Um, we, now again, we know that ultimately it would terminate because we'd run out of system resources and stack resources, uh, possibly before we even did the control C but it's going to terminate abnormally. In other words, the system operating system is going to shut it down, not because anything internal to the program caused it to, to cease operating. Okay, so from the programmer's perspective then, we can look at recursion as solving large problems by reducing them to smaller problems that have the same form as the larger problem. In other words, we're just breaking it down. Uh, 
That's probably better illustrated by the nesting dolls than it is by the print example because it wasn't really a smaller problem, but it was the same form. Okay, so we can split the problem into um, one or more simpler versions of itself, and we keep doing that until we have a way uh, where each one of the stopping cases are what we're going to come to call the base cases. Okay, so there's probably going to be all these functions probably have some kind of a conditional in there to, to determine when it is we're, we're done, if you will. Okay, so before we look at some of the more traditional recursion type problems like Fibonacci series and um, factorial, which we'll look at in a minute, but before we get into all the math stuff, let's take a look at a very simple example that illustrates the point without getting into um, any kind of complicated math. Not that either of those is incredibly complicated, but um, so we're going to do a simple blast off program. So it does a countdown, just like you hear when NASA launches a space shuttle or a satellite or something else. And it's going to count down from 10, and then when it gets to zero, it's going to print blast off. Um, so we can certainly do this iteratively, and we'll look at a way to do that, and then we'll look at recursively. So if we did it iteratively, it's just a simple loop that starts at 10, and as long as i is greater than zero, it prints the value of i. So print 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then in lieu of printing 0, because we're going to terminate the loop at that point, then we would print blast off. So it would print 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then blast off. Now if we're going to implement that recursively, we need a function to do this. We need a function that calls itself until it reaches the stopping case, which in this case is 0. So here's the declaration of the function, not the definition of it. And then here's main, which calls it with the initial value of 10, because that's where we want to start our countdown. And then, of course, when it's done, main is over. So here's the function. So we get the value in coming in, which in this case, when calling for main, would be a 10. As long as n is greater than 0, we print the value of, and this should be n. This is a copy and paste error from, from previous slide. So it should print n with an exclamation point after it. And then call countdown n minus 1. So it'll print 10 and then call countdown with 9, etc., etc. If n is not greater than 0, which means it is 0, then we're going to print blast off. So that's our base case. Okay, so it's going to print the same thing. It just does it a little bit differently. Okay. So what's really going on is you know, we get the 10 the first time. Think of this as starting a new mini program, which is for 10. And then that executes into the if statement. And since it's greater than 0, it starts another mini program for 9, etc., etc., if you will, until we get to the end. If we look at it, um, and we get do that all the way down to get countdown one, which prints the one, and then we don't the next time we don't start another mini program, well we start one more mini program, which is countdown of zero, but then that one it doesn't flow into the if statement, it flows into the else, and so uh, since zero is not greater than zero, so we execute the else statement, which prints blast off. If we look at this more pictorially, which is probably easier to see, we can see that. The first time we start this one, prints a 10 and calls countdown 9. So we think of it as a stack. Then countdown 9 prints 9 and calls countdown 8, etc. All the way down to when we get to countdown 0, which prints blast off. And then, although we don't see it in the picture, uh, we're essentially going to do returns to all these, even though there's no value that's being returned. This function didn't finish executing until this one does. So they're all going to return and we're going to unwind the stack and then we'll be returning to main and exiting the main program. We'll see another picture version of that for factorial in a minute that'll be more illustrative, if you will. Okay, so it was a simple example that didn't have any mathematical undertones, if you will, other than simple counting, which we've all been able to do since about kindergarten, although maybe not backwards. Um, so it wasn't the most enlightening, but it gives us an idea of how it works. So let's look at something else. Let's look at computing factorial, which is something we use a lot in uh, probability, in combinations of permutations, figuring out, you know, how many, what's the probability of picking a white ball from a bag that contains 10 black balls and five white balls, if we're drawing one at a time, when we put them back, and all that kind of stuff. Stuff you're going to learn in probability models if you haven't taken that course already. Um, so, factorial is defined, 4 factorial, for example, is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So it's a, it's a simple thing that we could implement iteratively, but we can also implement it recursively. Because we can take that same expression, we can write it in terms of the values themselves. So n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc. 
And then we also have a rule that you just have to accept that 0 factorial is 1, and that's just a definition of factorial. So uh, that'll be important for our base case here in a minute. Okay. So we can certainly do an iterative solution. That's just a loop. Uh, we have some value in, which is the value we want to compute, and we start p equal to 1, and then we start multiplying the values and, and then storing it back, um, just as you would expect. So j goes from n to greater than or equal to 1, and p times j, and then store that back in p, so we're just multiplying them up, um, just as you would expect. And there's just an example of doing it for n equal 3. If we want to do a recursive solution, the hard part, which is the first thing we have to do, is coming up with what does the recursive solution look like? In other words, what in this case, what does the equations look like that, that would implement a recursive solution? Um, and how do we think of it in a recursive manner? Okay. So remember, we're solving a larger problem by reducing it to a smaller problem of the same form. So in the recursive solution, good news is it's really kind of already defined for us recursively um, if we really look at it. Because really, 4 factorial is 4 times 4 minus 1 factorial, or 3 factorial. And so there's our recursive relationship. It's the current value times the times n minus 1 factorial, where n was in this case 4. Okay. So 10 is 10 times 9 factorial. And then so that defines a recursive relation. And then we have that base case um, for. 0 factorial. So we can in general say n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial, so that way you can already start to see implementation-wise how that would become a function that calls itself. And then we need that base case or stopping case, and we have that rule that says 0 factorial is 1. So in that case, uh, we have it. So this is, becomes our recurrence relationship, and you're going to learn more about those in algorithms class and learn to call them that, but it's, there's two parts. We say if n is equal to 0, n factorial is 1. If n is greater than 0, n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. And so that's the basis for the function that we need to write. Okay, So we need a function that calls itself until we reach the stopping case. So there's main, and there's the, def the, the uh, declaration of the function, and then here's the call in main for factorial of 10, for example. And then here's what the function looks like. So it receives n. If n is equal to 0, notice the use of the double equal. That's a real common C, C++ programming mistake to use a single equal sign there. So if n is 0, we return 1. Otherwise, we return n times factorial of n minus 1, all inside the parentheses there. So we'll call the function again, and we'll keep doing that until we get to something that satisfies the base case. Then we'll start unwinding, if you will, all those calls. So we'll get the same result. And it's a big number, 3,628,800. And if we look at it in pictures, like the other example, um, factorial of 10 returns 10 times factorial of 9, which returns 9 times factorial of 8. So we're stacking up all these calls, none of them returning yet, until we get down to this case, where factorial of 0 finally returns just a value. It doesn't involve a call to the function again. Then we can start unwinding all this. And we'll see that on another page. Okay. So here's the factorial of 0 returning a 1. And then 1 times factorial of 0 returns 1 times 1, which is 1. And then 2 times factorial of 1 returns 2 times 1, which is 2, and etc. And we see the values starting to get bigger as we get up into the bigger numbers until eventually we get to the last value. And we return there's 362,880, and then we're going to multiply, and multiply that by 10, and that's going to return that value back to main into this value factorial, this integer, and then we'll print that out and, and be done. Okay, so that factorial kind of helps you see what's going on. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a basic understanding of how factorial works with a couple of examples, one that wasn't a mathematical type approach, and one that involved a mathematical recurrence relation, albeit a fairly simple one. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of at least how recursion works. You may not be clear on all the different kinds of things where we might use them yet, other than to solve factorial. But you'll run across other ones, and we're going to do another example here in just a second, of uh, situations that use factorial. But we'll take a brief interlude, and hopefully you aren't in the category now uh, with recursion of thinking the elephant is bigger than the moon. So uh, 
just a brief comedic inter interruption there. Um, so let's look at another example. Uh, but let's review first what recursion is. So we know a recursive function is a function that calls itself. It really only solves a base case. If it's not the base case, then it breaks the problem up into smaller parts, whatever those may be, and then launches a simpler version of the original problem. And we keep doing that until we get to one of those base cases. And then we unwind everything. So why do we use it? Well, it's an elegant solution to a lot of complex problems. Many of you uh, may recognize this, this quote as a, as a parody of, a, of, a, of a, uh, another quote. To err is human, to forgive design, divine. This is to iterate as human, to recurse as divine by a fairly famous computer scientist. Um, yeah, we like to meet to works and come up with new versions of quotes for ourselves. <clears throat> so some solutions are naturally recursive, and those are pretty easy to spot. Others aren't necessarily that way. Um, but in a lot of cases, the recursive solutions help us write less code, and they're easier to read. But they may also um, be more difficult in some cases. So it's true, it turns out, that every problem that we can solve recursively can be solved with iteration. The converse of that, however, is not true. Every problem we solve with iteration cannot be solved recursively. So don't assume just because you have an iterative solution, you can come up with a recursive solution. But know that with a recursive solution, there is an iterative solution. In some cases, the iterative solution is a lot harder. One of the examples we're not going to do uh, here, but you may find later, is the Towers of Annoy. Uh, not the Towers of Annoy, uh, although it can be annoying. Um, but the Towers of Hanoi, uh, the iterative solution is way harder than the recursive solution in that case. Um, recursive solutions do take up a lot of memory and CPU time. That may or may not be faster than the iterative solution. And we can run into stack problems if, if we recurse too many levels. So that's something we have to be aware of that when we compile our programs, we may have to allow for more stack space or be aware that we may overflow the stack and that may cause a problem if we do numbers that are too large, for example, the Fibonacci series. Because the Fibonacci series, a good example, uses 2 to the n function calls. So whatever the value of n is, 2 to that power is how many, function, how many times we're going to have to call the function. Yeah. So we're trading off performance versus good software engineering. Okay, let's look at the Fibonacci series uh, now. So this is another naturally occurring recursive one. Um, we can certainly do an iterative solution, but it's a little more difficult. Um, so this is a good example of a naturally occurring one. Now, if you remember the Fibonacci series, it starts out with two ones, and then after the first term, the, the terms are the sum of the previous two terms. So we have the first two ones, and then 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13, 13 plus 8 is 21, etc. Um, so we can define the Fibonacci series this way, as the base case is both Fib1 and Fib2 are equal to 1, and then the recurrence relation, the, the part that's going to be the recursive part, is the Fibonacci of n is the Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 2 for all n greater than 2. So if n is less than 2, we fall into these cases, if, n is, if less than or equal to 2, and if n is greater than 2, then, then we develop naturally recursive thing. Although notice that there's going to have to be two calls to the recursive function this one. So instead of 2 to the n, it's going to be 2 times 2 to the n, if you will, for how many functions we have to call. Yeah. So if we were going to code that recursively, I'm going to leave you to figure out how to code it iteratively, or you can look it up on the internet as well, but it's a good ex exercise for you. Um, it would look something like this. Again, here's main that's going to call up with an initial value of 10, and then here's the function. So if n is less than or equal to 2, we return a 1, because Fibonacci of 2 and Fibonacci of 1 are both 1. Otherwise, we return Fib of n minus 1 plus Fib of n minus 2. And we could put, certainly put parentheses around that. I usually would to make it clear that that's all part of the return, but, but it will work in either case. So this program would then print out the 10th Fibonacci number in the sequence, whatever that is. In this case, it's 55. So the point was that in many cases it's a lot easier. Trust me, if you try to do it iteratively, you're going to find out it's a little more difficult. Um, it's, in this case, a little more elegant as well. may or may not be faster than the iterative solution, although I think you'll find in this case it is. Um, and they're ob often the obvious choice. Once you get used to thinking about how things could be recursive, you'll see the things that are at least naturally recursive in nature uh, more easily.
Okay, so hopefully that'll, and it's something that you're going to do a lab on, so you're going to have an opportunity to do some Fibonacci, not Fibonacci, but some recursive stuff in the lab. Um, and we may run across some problems that are, that are recursive in nature as we go through uh, the rest of the class. So hopefully you semi-understand recursion. You can certainly go Google other results for recursion. Um, I'm sure you know where to find Google. Type in recursion and see what you get. So that's recursion. Wasn't that a fascinating topic? I think you'll find that it's uh, that it's interesting, although some people struggle with it in the beginning, just because it's one of those paradigm shifts. It's a different way of thinking about solving problems. We think about doing everything step by step by step, and we don't think about uh, breaking it down into smaller versions of the same problem and, and solving it that way. But if you think about some of these examples, that'll help you as you approach other problems that may have a recursive solution that, that is a good natural fit. And this just brings you that much closer to being more of an expert computer science major so that you don't end up having to ask people if they want fries with that for your uh, job after college. So hopefully you've enjoyed this, and I'll see you in the next video lecture or in class.